Pollinating at least one third of our crop production, the honeybees buzz around scavenging for food. Bees travel from plant to plant to get their protein from pollen and the carbohydrates they need from nectar. The pollinating services we benefit from are an emergent property of the bees' lives. Honeybees add more than $15 billion in value to our farming and agriculture each year. Although since 2006 at an alarming rate, commercial beekeepers are finding their hives void of bees. The bees are just disappearing. These empty hives have traces of recent activity, a little wax, some honey, and the honeycombs, but no sign of the bees. This epidemic is known as Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD. Now, 2013, the bees are continuing to disappear at a rate never seen before. One third of honey bee colonies in the U.S. died or disappeared over the past winter. Normally, over the last 20 years, beekeepers will lose around 10 to 15 percent of their colonies each winter, but this year they lost 30 percent of their colonies, a dramatic increase in comparison. And while humanity has been killing off bees over the last 50 years, we are planting more and more crops that need bees to thrive. Across the world, there is a 300 percent increase in crop production that require bee pollination. But the cause of CCD is inconclusive. There is no one facet to point fingers at. CCD may be the bifurcation point that changes how we receive our colorful and diverse nutrients. A systematic approach and a variety of environmental practices could contain the answer and prevent us from an extreme regulatory episode. Without bees, our food system may dramatically change for the worst. As Danila Meadows would say, we have found ourselves in an escalating system trap, and we are shifting the burden to the intervener. Or in other words, we are addicted to our agriculture practices. So now let's take a look at the potential culprits in the cause of colony collapse disorder. Bees are under attack from several pests and bacterial diseases. The viral destructor is the largest of concern and has been attacking bees for decades. These mites were brought to the states in 1987 from South America and have killed billions of bees since. These little mites suck on the bees hemolymph, which is basically the bees blood. And once the varro pierces the bee's exoskeleton, it can circulate viruses and other diseases into the bee's system. And if the mites get out of control, the entire hive can die. Many beekeepers don't know how to handle the tiny pests, but the evidence is inconclusive. Many hives still survive even with the varro mite present. To increase yields, our agriculture practices have changed from lively, colorful, diverse ecosystems to monotonous, simplified fields of few crops. The monoculture creates a larger yield of one crop but reduces the self-resilience of the fields and nearby ecosystems. The largest problem for the bees with monoculture is the limited time throughout the year that the bees have access to nutrition. For example, almonds are completely dependent on bee pollination to thrive, yet our almond orchards have grown so large in scale and become such monocultures the bees are trucked in and sometimes even flown in from Australia to pollinate the orchard for the two weeks of pollination. The almond orchard becomes a vast and flowerless landscape after harvest. Our monocultures have grown so large that for miles there are no other plants or flowers around for the bees to survive on. The bees cannot sustain life year-round under such conditions. Yet if the almond orchards of California were to fail, the industry could lose four billion dollars. Even though we know the benefits from the pollinating services, since World War II we have been killing off bees, and today there are about half the number of hives since the war. After World War II, many of the chemicals we used in warfare became chemicals we used on our crops to rid of unwanted pests. With the increase in monoculture, the fields became less self-resilient and the potential for greater feedback oscillations began to grow larger. As we moved our practices further from self-resilience and closer to bifurcation, we recognized the vulnerability of our crops. We created the escalating system trap and an addiction to our chemicals. As we continued to put band-aids on the problem, we shifted the burden to the intervener and increased our chemical use to further our attempts to simplify the fields. We even began using synthetic fertilizers to fix the soil and herbicides to rid of unwanted weeds we continue to try and take control of a wild natural system. With the amount of pesticides and herbicides sprayed each year, whether being used on large-scale farming or home gardening, 
bees are inevitably exposed to the chemicals. When studying bee pollen, each batch contained residues with at least six detectable pesticides in it, including every class of insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and unlabeled ingredients used in the pesticide formulas. Often the unlabeled ingredients are more toxic than the active ingredients. With all of these traces found in the bee pollen, surely the bees are harmed. The pesticides of largest concern in the U.S. are the neonicotinoids. The neonicotinoids are usually applied to the seed, and throughout growth, the pesticide moves through the plant. Although in small doses, the chemical remains in the plant and finds its way into the pollen and nectar. The concern comes after the bee pollinates the plant. The bee may become intoxicated and disoriented after ingesting the neonicotinoids and cannot find its way home. Europe, using their precautionary principle, has already put a two-year restriction on some of the neonicotinoids. Still, with the restriction, France's bees continue to die off, and France has had restricted neonicotinoid usage since 1999. Australia has seemingly low CCD, even with large-scale neonicotinoid use. With uncooperative results across the world, it is unlikely the U.S. will put a ban on these chemicals even though their function is to kill insects. Without bees, our meals would become less colorful, consisting of common self-pollinating foods like corn, wheat, and rice. The food system may not completely collapse right away, but the planet would become a hungrier and poorer place. Far from economical, humans may have to rely on pollinating plants with paintbrushes or creating feedlots for beekeeping. Bees may in fact be an indicator species for something bigger. What is to come in a world without bees may devastate the planet, but it doesn't have to be this way. There are several leveraging points in which we can escape the system's traps. To escape the reinforcing escalating trap of increasing yields, simplifying our fields, and reducing bee population, we need to look closer at our past. Historically, humans have been drawn to bees since the beginning of time, and bees have survived over the last 50 million years. It has only become a problem in the last decade that our changes in agriculture have affected the population of bees. In order to reverse the vicious decline of bee population, we must let go of the attempted control of our fields and allow for biodiversity. Instead of using synthetic fertilizers, we must return to planting nitrogen-fixing cover crops like alfalfa and clover. And by planting cover crops, we can provide highly nutritious food plants for bees and reduce soil erosion. If we allow the unwanted weeds to grow in the fields, the bees will have more access to high nutrition and the fields will begin to gain their self-resilience once more. Taking it one step at a time, we can wean ourselves off of our addiction to chemicals. Our chemical use is nested within our monoculture practices. If farmers instead planted a variety of crops and flowers in between crop rows, we could provide year-round nutrients for the world's most important pollinators. The more we move towards biodiversity in our fields, the stronger the field self-resilience. And the stronger the field self-resilience, the healthier the bee populations. And the healthier the bee populations, the more the colonies can fight off the pests and diseases, some like the viral mites. They are systems nested within systems. Although seemingly independent, these systems are interconnected and together can reach for dynamic equilibrium. Although CCD seems like a problem created in large-scale agricultural and farming practices, every individual can help save one of our greatest assets. The easiest and simplest solution is to provide bees with healthy, lively, diverse habitats by planting bee-friendly flowers without pesticides. At home, at work, at community gardens, around farms, along roads, bees need their own highways of plants to travel, dance, thrive, and survive. The solution will not be found in simplifying the systems, the solution will be found in diversity. As Marla Spivak, a professor of entomology at the University of Minnesota simply put it, when bees have access to good nutrition, we have access to good nutrition through their pollinating services.